Gangsters are supposed to be seen as tough thugs with little regard for the law. But what happens when fake gangsters are faced with real prison time? I don't want nobody to tell no dumb s***. These are three never-before-seen examples of when wannabe gangsters realizing they'll be serving prison time. Starting with the case of 18-year-old Conrad Troja, who in September of 2010 was leaving school when he was approached by a man holding a handgun. Conrad was ordered to take off his bag and hand it over, but when he refused, he was shot in the chest by the man. Miraculously, Conrad managed to stumble away from the scene and call for help before collapsing and dying on the spot. The suspect fled immediately, but was later identified as Ed Tavion Wilcox, who was brought in for attempted murder. But as it turns out, he wasn't all that tough in the interrogation room. All right, here's the deal. You know something else happened. I don't sit here and talk to you without knowing what the deal is, all right? We've been talking to people. We've been interviewing people. We've been put, showing people pictures. We've been looking at video. I didn't bring you up here because you weren't wearing your seatbelt, okay? You got arrested for a burglary before and they didn't even bring you up here. Obviously, it's something a little more serious. Wilcox is trying to remain calm and pretend as though he's got no idea what this is all about. But little does he know, his getaway driver had also been apprehended and confessed to everything. Now, the detective just has to find a way to get him to confess as well. This is going to go one of two ways. You're either going to be a guy who made a mistake, hanging around the wrong place the wrong time, did something dumb, or you're going to be a guy that goes out and likes to shoot people for fun, okay? I th Listen, and before you say anything, I think you're a guy that made a mistake. I know you were there, okay? I know what happened. I've talked to the victim. The victims picked you out of a photo lineup and said, that's the guy that shot me, okay? Here's the deal. I don't think you shot that guy because you're a bad person. You didn't mean to kill that guy, okay? What happened was, is you were just trying to snatch his backpack, he started fighting with you, and you got scared. So uh, y'all saying I shot somebody? I know you shot somebody. Imagine you're an 18-year-old kid who got in over their head and ended up shooting and killing an innocent civilian. No matter who you are, you'll be feeling scared. A feeling that'll only be amplified when a police officer asserts that they know exactly what happened. Wilcox will be feeling rattled now. As the cop talks, he's slumped over in his chair, implying he's interested in what the cop is saying, and as soon as he's allowed to talk, all his responses sound confused and even bewildered. The cop knows he has him on the back foot. Now he just needs to close it out. You're 18, right? You're 18, yes? Yeah. This is where you need to stand up and be a man and admit you made a mistake. I know you weren't trying to kill that guy. I know that because you're not the kind of guy that does that. You panicked, you got scared, you got in over your head. The victim's making you out to be a stone cold, just straight up thug killer. Guy that doesn't give a about anybody else, all right? If, if, if you keep going down the path you're going down telling me you didn't have anything to do with it, it's not you, it's not you, who are people gonna believe? Are they gonna believe you or are they gonna believe the victim? They're gonna have to believe the victim because you didn't give me your side of the story. Wilcox is being pushed into a corner. The detective is using the facts that he knows Wilcox is just in over his head, but is using language in such a way that makes him feel like he's accused of being this cold-blooded monster. His reactions to this prove just how well this technique is working. He stares at the ground implying shame and rubs his head in a pacifying behavior that shows how stressed he is. A guy that sits there like you, is not a guy that goes around and kills people. You understand what I'm saying? You have remorse, you're sorry, I can see it on. You just need to take that next step. What happened in that parking lot? Did you guys plan it? Or did it just happen? Huh? I can't, I can't, what'd you say? Hey, don't he, remember how we talked about that don't think about that that's the least of your concerns right now in a breakdown that's far from gangster wilcox starts to cry and laments on how he absolutely can't go back to jail the detective uses this moment of vulnerability to press him further and tells him he has one last opportunity to be honest and let everybody know that he isn't the monster they think he is do you say stop hitting me or i'm gonna shoot you Anything like that? I was like, I had my hand like right here. No, you had your left hand like up against him? Yeah. Trying to push him away? I was trying to make him stop hitting me. Where was the gun? In my pocket. Which pocket? This one. How many times did you shoot? One. What happened after you pulled the trigger? Did he fall down or? No. Was he, he was still standing up? 
Where'd you hit him? I didn't even know I hit him. Okay. So you fired that one round. What happened? It froze up. You just froze up? And just like that, Edtavian Wilcox confessed to shooting Conrad Tohan and was sentenced to life in prison, all over a school bag. But while he'll be spending the rest of his life in prison, Demetrius Cox wasn't so lucky. Throughout the beginning of 2020, a war between rival gangs 438 and AFNF began to break out. Many shootings were reported with dozens of deaths attributed to just these two gangs, with one of these occurring on the 14th of April. Shots were fired at a house party in Davenport, Florida, resulting in the death of 20-year-old Wolf Luma. The killer was identified almost immediately as Demetrius Cox, also 20 years old. Two weeks later, Cox was brought in on the suspicion of murder, and an interrogation began, ending in one of the most shocking moments in interrogation history. Dang, dude. Sir, I just, you can say I can't. And I didn't check your hand before because we weren't able to, but now we can, right? Open and close. Yes, sir! Number one, I gotta tell you, I'm pretty impressed of the way the, uh, just overall, your persona as it is. Yes, so, I appreciate the respect. It's gonna be yes, given right back to you, okay? Okay. Cox starts the interrogation out respectfully, but as the interview continues, he starts to annoy the detective by withholding information that could get members of his gang into trouble. This type of loyalty is extremely common in these types of cases, but can prove to work against you, as is seen just a few minutes later. I'm not saying you went there for the wrong reasons. However, man, I tell you one thing. You know how they say, like, victims, victims, and suspects, suspects, things like that? I thought that you were a victim. Sure I am, but now y'all make it like I'm a suspect. No, 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 no. I thought, crazy. You, were I thought you were I thought you were a victim, and I thought that you were going to give us the justification, I, the explanation for what happened. Listen. But you come in here, and you can't even, even with little details like that, like, who cares? If Papa J is there, why can't you just be honest and say, yeah, he was there. So you're we, we hung up. So, but so if what's, I got, what's, I got another question what's more like hard about the truth? What's interesting about this case, though, is that the cop actually isn't 100% sure that Cox is the killer. As Cox mentions earlier, most of the evidence in the case is hearsay, and detectives could have a hard time using it in court. This is why Cox is here in the first place. If they could extract a confession, it'd make their lives a whole lot easier. But Cox isn't budging. Okay, listen. If you want to tell me what happened, I'm all ears, man. I just tried to tell you what happened. Look, 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 look at me in my face. Look at me in my face. You not. If you tell me the truth, I will believe you. But there is an explanation for what happened. So you trying to say I'm the explanation or something? Yeah. I'm at, that's what I'm asking. It's you. like you're hearing me, but you're not listening to me. L listen. To I'm what listening I'm to you, but you're not letting me. L you gotta break to me. it down for me. Listen Please to me. break it down. Listen for to me. me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that you might have been a victim. But I cannot believe a victim when they leave little things out, little details about that night. Well, okay. Mister, I told you all I know. Some bad happened, man. Some yeah. bad happened. I understand what and you're I don't saying. think that you forced it. I don't think that you or your buddies or anybody else, well, maybe, maybe you're running your mouth a little bit, but it wasn't justified what happened. Okay. Eventually, the detective decides that he's not going to get anything else out of Cox and calls off the interrogation. But that's not where the case ends. In fact, the most interesting but tragic part happened just hours after the interrogation was held. Later that day, Cox was released on bail, but 11 hours later, he was shot and killed by another gang member. Meaning, if he had actually confessed, he just might have spared his own life even if it was spending that life in prison. But while Cox may have kept it together in his interrogation and preserved his gangster image, the same cannot be said for Cody Forencam, a gangster whose crime was littered with errors and stupidity from the very start. After his phone was stolen at a convenience store, Cody went on a tyrannical rampage around his area looking for any signs of the stolen device. Surveillance footage captured him walking past 15-year-old Deshaun Hills, pulling a gun from his backpack and firing three shots at the boy, killing him instantly. Witnesses and surveillance footage helps police identify Cody almost immediately, and he was quickly brought in for interrogation. I said, I ain't, you know, what I just did with the people yesterday, these motherfuckers was able to do this to me. They was able to look at Okay, okay, I'll take a look at this at a second. I'm saying, look at, look at how they do me. 
Okay. Look how they do me. They just kicked my mom's door open, man. Well, they didn't they, kick your mom's door open. Yeah, they did, man. Oh, I was on the phone, man, with, with somebody while it happened, man. We were there. We're, we were there at your mom's. Come on, man. We, well, like, I said, like, like, like I said, man, I ain't about that. Okay, you're I don't right. gangbang. I don't do, you know what I mean? I ain't with the guns. Cody here is referring to a search warrant that was used by police to gain access to his mother's house and collect evidence. While his anger about this is likely from a place of truth, he's also using it as a way to try and argue his innocence. This is also backed up by the fact that he immediately tells the cop that he has nothing to do with gang activity or guns. But it won't take long for this facade to fall apart. You were here because you're involved with this murder. You've told people, you've told people. That's why you're here, you're, that's why you're not in Minneapolis. Okay, we have, to, we have talked to people, all right, man, check that, that have put you there at the scene. There's video of you at the scene. The whole time. The whole time. Okay, we know why you're there. I ain't buying it. You're not buying it. Buying I'm not here to lie to you though. Why would, I, why would I lie to you? I ain't buying it. You're on video. Okay, people are talking to you. You're talking to them. Okay. You approach people and talk to them. On the evening of the murder, Cody had been walking around the area asking people if they saw the person that took his phone and aggressively confronting people that he suspected. He was also clearly seen on surveillance footage at multiple stores and businesses in the Minneapolis area, so any arguments he has here that he was elsewhere are completely invalid. Like Cody, said, I ain't, I ain't, like, like I Cody, all we're trying I don't to know do. It all. Here's the you thing. Don't know it all. Can I just say something? If I was sitting in your chair. And I had two. Dude, I got mercy, dude. Hold on a second. I got mercy, dude. Look, look at this shit. Sit down. Look at this shit. Sit down. Look at this shit. Yep, sit down. Yeah, it's yep. crazy. So, hey, sit really, down for I don't even want to. Like, Here's I'm one so thing. One thing. Mad. One thing. Hold I'm on. I'm so fing mad right now. No, I was supposed yeah. to. I was supposed to. I was supposed to. Yeah. ERT. Ooh, 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 ooh. They all come talking about some goofy shit that I don't know. Goofy? It's, yeah. a, it's a murder. Some goofy shit. It's a murder. Some goofy shit. Like, like I ain't there. Okay. Like well, here's what I'm going to say just before we go, okay? Was that. If I was sitting in your chair and I had two people ask me where I was on a specific day and they're saying that I, I did a murder. That's what Durfee did with me just yesterday. I'm not talking about Durfee. I'm saying if you ask me what I ate for dinner, I might not remember. Also take a look at Cody's language and demeanor in general. Right from the start, he's been defensive and attempting to combat every single thing the detectives have said to him. Instead of respectfully listening to their points and trying to give counters to the cop's evidence, he either talks over them or just says, I don't believe you, and fails to give any evidence in his defense. If Cody was innocent, he'd likely be doing everything he can to stay on the cop's good side and help them out by providing evidence that would acquit him. And as it turns out, he was about to start providing evidence. Evidence that would send him straight to jail. Oh, you would have Wally's and boom, 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 boom. You were by Wally's, absolutely. I was by Wally's. You were? But y'all don't know the motherfucking story. Well, tell me. Because the motherfucker was supposed to be in the motherfucking face, stole my phone, all that stupid shit. That don't mean I pulled the motherfucking trigger. Just because some people say some shit, it, that's what it is. That's what it is. So y'all gonna go with the fuck you here anyway. I was over at the store and I got fucking my. That's what that was. Who, who jumped you? I don't, I don't Like I said, I don't know. When? That don't make me no murder. When? I called my big cousin. My big cousin come get me. He, ooh, 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 what it looked like. I said, one was, one was, ooh, I don't know. None came on me. When you act like, can I pull the trigger on somebody? When did you get jumped or when did you get your stuff robbed? Cody, so somebody jumped you for your phone, right? Did they, did they get anything else from you? Or did you have money? Did you Wallet, have ID. In an outburst of more anger, Cody has just put himself right next to the scene of the crime and given the officers a motive for the murder. For the next four minutes, Cody scrambled to get himself out of the hole he just dug himself into. But it was already too late. With the evidence they already had, plus what essentially amounted to a full confession, Cody was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 38 years behind bars.